Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at the Listening Post. This week, a power-sharing deal in Baghdad <laughs> and the ever-changing media landscape in Iraq. Ever heard of St. Helena? We didn't think so. St. Helena, police seven. It's a tiny island with one media outlet for every thousand inhabitants. A Mexican diplomat says the global media, when covering drug wars in his country, lack the necessary context. So we'll give him some. And the Onion.com takes on Time magazine. A new version of their magazine for adults. In our web video of the week. Aimed at an audience ready for grown-up news. We begin with a story of ideological wrangling between Iraqis and Kurds, Shias and Sunnis. We're not just talking about politicians in Baghdad. We're talking about the Iraqi media. They're as factionalized as the government that has taken eight months to come to an agreement on power sharing. From the pro-Shia, pro-Nuri al-Maliki channel al-Iraqiya to the Sunni sympathetic anti-Maliki al-Baghdadiya TV, Iraq's media space is a cacophony of politically and religiously motivated voices. Iraq's Communications and Media Commission has since entered the fray, says it wants to bring order to the country's media, but is viewed with skepticism by journalists and media owners alike. Our starting point this week is Baghdad, the sharing of the spoils and the responsibilities of power, the Iraqi media's growing pains, and the disconnect between the way this story is covered in Iraq versus what Americans are seeing in their media. سوء فهم انسحاب القائمة العراقية لم يكن على حد ما وصف بأنه بداية لطريق وعر. Iraq's media is a direct reflection of the country's sectarian divide. وذكرت مصادر برلمانية. A maze of Byzantine, almost Kafkaesk arrangements. بس حكومة المالكية. Iraqis tend to view a channel that is for their sect or their party, and the country remains very much divided. Along those lines, One of the positive things that can be said about the Iraqi media, particularly the television channels, is that they do accurately reflect the country they report on. But they do so collectively. Individually, they are factional. And unfortunately, viewers can only watch one channel at a time. We understand from studies that more than half of the population watches television here. They often tune into channels that already reflect their political views and sectarian allegiances. Now, when it came to the specific power sharing deal uh, recently, different channels reported different leaks depending on what access or the kind of political blocks, the different political blocks that they had access to. And obviously, the footage and commentary was affected um, as well. If you are a Shiite TV channel, you will be in favor of this power sharing agreement because it has brought their own people into power. If you watch a Sunni channel like Al Baghdadiya or Al Sharqiya, you will dismiss the whole thing as a waste of time and it will not work because their mission is to undermine the other side. So it's become a sort of like a conflict through the media. The media was a key factor in, as a driver of the civil war, and each group had its own media. And in the run-up to, to the elections, we saw certain Iraqi channels promoting certain ideas. So you had the channels that were identified with some of the Shia sectarian parties promoting this fear that Ba'athists are coming back. The Ba'athists are coming back. They had all kinds of documentaries about Saddam's victims and mass graves. And the whole point of that was to remind people, don't vote for Alawi. You vote for Alawi, Saddam is going to come back. They're really playing on that fear. It is the job of Iraq's Communications and Media Commission, the CMC, to regulate what goes on air or into print. The CMC was created in 2004, and just prior to the election last March, it announced it would crack down on any broadcaster deemed to be inciting hatred or violence. But the problem is there were no clear guidelines as to what exactly uh, that meant. Already journalists here have been complaining about restrictions that include a uh, crackdown on journalists trying to film at, uh, the aftermath of bombing sites, the aftermath of violence uh, here in the country. In the new Iraq, there wasn't supposed to be any body that would regulate journalists. It was supposed to be a self-regulated process, really. But there are a lot of concerns uh, now that the CMC could be taking on a new role. Some look at it as a means by the government to muzzle the media, to control the opposition, to violate freedom of speech. 
That view was reinforced late last month. Al-Baghdadiya, a Sunni-owned channel, was covering a mass hostage-taking at a Baghdad church. The channel reported that it got a call from the hostage-takers who claimed to be Al-Qaeda members and it broadcast their demands. Shortly after that, the channel started reporting that Iraqi security forces stormed their offices in Baghdad. By next morning, the country's communication and media uh, commission announced it had shut down the channel's offices in Baghdad. The channel now is broadcasting from its main base in uh, Cairo and from a broadcast center in Damascus. Now, al-Baghdadi in its own defense, it said, we are only broadcasting information that came to us. Al Jazeera does that sometimes if it gets a tape from bin Laden, you know, and they broadcast it, it's information. And Al Iraqiya party, headed by Iyad Alawi, uh, has actually criticized the closure because they said it's violation of the freedom of speech. But that is typical of the approach to the media taken by the Iraqi authorities. They're willing to tolerate a partisan free-for-all on the airwaves unless it involves al-Qaeda or anyone of that ilk. There's been a, a pattern throughout uh, the, the Maliki regime of targeting channels who show the propaganda or issue the statements of Al-Qaeda or other insurgent groups. Although I think certainly when it comes to Al-Qaeda, that group is so extreme and such a fringe group that their message doesn't really have any appeal to anybody. And this was certainly uh, an excessively heavy-handed thing to do to, to, uh, to shut down Baghdad. The power-sharing government there with Shia... Iraq was also prominent in American media as the power-sharing agreement was reached. But they focused less on the political news from Baghdad than they did on former President George Bush. It was eerily coincidental that Bush's autobiography, Decision Points, went on sale the day before the power-sharing deal was made. And at that point, the U.S. media made their decision to focus on George Bush making the media rounds rather than the after-effects of Bush's policies on Iraq. Clearly merits more attention given that American foreign policy is going to be grappling with the consequences of the Iraq intervention for decades to come. We basically provided a training ground for uh, Islamic extremist insurgents to come in and, and train and develop new tactics where we've seen these tactics and technologies infiltrate into other parts of the region to, to Afghanistan, to Yemen, Somalia. The end of combat operations in Iraq. But having said that, I mean, that's a fairly high level strategic approach. And, and I have to be fair and say U.S. media doesn't really specialize in, in that kind of an understanding of the world. They understand that most Americans aren't really interested in that. And I think that's a shame, but it is the reality the news. Our Global Village Voice is now on the coverage of news in Iraq. After the 2003 invasion of Iraq and the fall of Saddam, a plethora of privately owned media organizations, many of which openly opposed to the government, flourished. Does that mean that Iraq has a free and fair press? Unfortunately not. Since the war, over 200 media personnel have been killed, journalists have been kidnapped, and many have been arrested under draconian and outmoded defamation laws. The state of the media in Iraq is uh, pretty much reflective of the politics of the country. Everybody has their own media working for them. They're very ferocious in advocating their viewpoints, as are many of the political parties. Definitely will not change uh, until the government is stabilized, until democracy is stabilized. And if we do have democracy in government, eventually we will need democracy in the Iraqi media. Our Global Village Voices platform is how our viewers let us know what they think of the global media and the way that news is covered. We've now surpassed 5,000 fans on Facebook. You can go to Facebook or to our Twitter page to see what stories we're working on and how you can weigh in. You can also reach us through email at listeningpost at aljazeera.net. Time now for Listening Post News Bites. The Mexican ambassador to Washington has a bone to pick with the media. He says they are absolutely fixated on one story in Mexico, drug-related violence. But one of the challenges that I think that we face, especially when it comes to international media, is that unfortunately you do see the dynamic of if it bleeds, it leads. Ambassador Arturo Sarucan spoke out on the issue at the U.S. Council on Foreign Relations, saying there is a narrative in the international media's reporting of Mexico that fails to contextualize the situation there. Well, here is some context for the ambassador that might explain why the media are preoccupied 
with the story. According to Mexico's National Human Rights Commission, quote, 65 journalists have been murdered in Mexico this decade alone. 10 journalists have been killed this year, unquote. According to the New York-based Committee to Protect Journalists, which spent four years examining the issue of drug-related violence against reporters, quote, systemic impunity has taken root at the state and local levels. The criminal justice system has failed to successfully prosecute more than 90% of press-related crimes, and complicity between police and criminals is so common that many people see the justice system as being controlled by the criminals. Unquote. And one of the reasons that the international media are so focused on the story is that they can get away with talking about it. Reporting on drugs and violence in Mexico, from Mexico, has become just too dangerous for local reporters. After months of negotiations that seemed to fall apart just a few weeks ago, it's now official. Newsweek, the American news magazine, and the Daily Beast, a news and opinion website, have merged. The new entity has an unwieldy name. The Newsweek Daily Beast Company, it will be overseen by Newsweek's owner, Sidney Herman, who bought the troubled magazine back in August for just one dollar, taking on a load of debt, and the founder of the Daily Beast, Tina Brown. Brown made her name as the editor of two major American magazines, Vanity Fair and The New Yorker. The happy couple went on CNN's Reliable Sources, where host Howard Kurtz had an interesting, perhaps self-serving, question for them. Let me ask you, financially, though, uh, with 250 people working at Newsweek, 70 to Daily Beast, now a combined company, is it, is it an inevitable, uh, Sidney Harmon, that there'll be some job cuts? Kurtz recently quit his position as the Washington Post's media critic to take a job with the Daily Beast. He still got his job, as far as we can tell. According to the New York Times, Newsweek's website will soon disappear. Visitors to Newsweek.com will be automatically redirected to the Daily Beast site. The parents of Madeleine McCann, the young British girl who went missing in 2007, have signed a book deal. They're going to write about their daughter's disappearance in Portugal. Kate and Jerry McCann say they're doing it for the money, not for themselves, they say. The fund that they set up to help find Madeline is running out of money, and the McCanns say they will donate all of the proceeds from the book to help keep the search alive. The Madeline McCann story occupied hours of airtime and acres of newsprint in the UK and beyond back in 2007 and 2008. The couple decided then to tap into the power of the news media, and the coverage that followed triggered a huge manhunt and all kinds of donations that are now, according to the family, just beginning to run out. The fastest selling video game of all time, Call of Duty Black Ops, is coming under fire in Cuba. Set in 1961, at the height of the Cold War, the game begins with an assassination attempt by U.S. Special Forces on a young Fidel Castro. Castro. We went in to kill Castro. That's just a little too realistic for some Cubans who estimate there have been hundreds of real-life assassination plots against their former president. So Cuba's state-run media have slammed the game for trying to legitimize murder in the name of entertainment. Among the comments made on Cuban media, quote, what the United States could not accomplish in more than 50 years, they're now trying to do virtually, unquote. The video game is made by an American company, Treyarch. Don't think that it is only governments in places like Cuba, though, that get offended by games like these. Just last month, another game, the latest edition of Medal of Honor, was banned from U.S. military camps because gamers were able to play as Taliban members trying to kill U.S. forces. DreamWorks, the company behind that game, has since modified it, but we're betting the early editions of Medal of Honor will end up being collector's items in Afghanistan. We're back after the break with a piece on a place you've probably never heard of, and some media outlets you'll never read or hear. Welcome back. Here are three words that we can safely say have seldom been used, at least together, for the past two centuries. Dateline St. Helena. St. Helena is a small, isolated British colony in the middle of the South Atlantic Ocean, best known as the island on which Napoleon Bonaparte spent his final years in exile. These days, St. Helena gets by on coffee exports, a little tourism, and about $40 million a year in subsidies from Great Britain. And there's no shortage of local media there. The population, a mere 4,000 people, has two newspapers and two radio stations covering the island. Media outlets have, in fact, doubled in number over the past few years, and now the colonial government is trying to figure out how to regulate them. The Listening Post's Nick Muirhead now on the British microcolony and its microcosmic media story. This is Jamestown, the capital of St. Helena, 
Its population is around 800, so it's hardly a bustling metropolis. The last big news story to break here was the death of Napoleon in 1821. Since then, the news has been a little more local, like this bulletin on the country's state-owned radio. The St. Helena Police Service reported the following activities for the weekend. There was one arrest made for a person driving over the prescribed alcohol limit. Not exactly well, cutting-edge journalism, but on an island so small it only requires four-digit number plates, there isn't much to report. And over the years, a lot of the stories have been off-limits. It is difficult being a journalist on St. Helena. I mean, I worked in radio for 29 years, and it was owned by government. So you've got a government station, I, I was being paid by government, so you dare not throw stones on government. I like to think that we could do more with the Herald, but because of our constraints, you know, we can't, and I think that a lot of readers are that they really want that, and just we can't offer it. That's because the Herald and Radio St. Helena are controlled by the government, the way all media were until five years ago. Then things changed. And in the headlines today... The when St. FM and its sister newspaper, The Independent, came into being, the islanders finally had a media free from government control, outlets that could report on the shortcomings of politicians and government officials, like this report, which alleged that medical malpractice led to the death of a newborn baby. This is Malcolm and Lisa who shared their story. It's never been done on St. Helena before. People have had complaints and uh, it's just, they just hadn't had the courage to come forward and have their story heard. And an important point to mention here is that they felt comfortable to come to an independent media to share their story. Not everyone sees that story as a journalistic breakthrough for the island. It was reported, in my view, extremely badly. And had it been reported in the manner that it was, with photographs of dead babies and this sort of thing in the UK, then the offending newspaper would have been for the high jump. The Press Complaints Council would, would, would have murdered them. Not only would there be questions of retractions and, and, and getting it right, there would also have been a fairly significant fine. Mike Olson would have been on the receiving end of that fine. He is the owner and editor of The Independent, as well as the owner and presenter of St. FM. You could call him the Rupert Murdoch of St. Helena, only more hands-on. We are more what uh, you would expect from a newspaper outside St. Helena, maybe, more European newspaper, um, but of course a much smaller scale and, and smaller news. In 2008, the government ruled that media outlets could either accept public funding or generate revenue from advertising. They couldn't do both. That order came from the governor, he carries so much weight on the island, his car doesn't even need a license plate number, just the symbol of the British crown. Two years later, the Independent has a circulation of around 1,000, compared to eight or 900 for the state-run Herald. In a way, neither of them can quite stand alone, and we, we help both of them. And the population is fairly evenly divided as to which they prefer. So if we can afford to keep both going, I think that's a good thing to do. What else is going on that's of relevance? Tony Moore is an expatriate living on St. Helena. He hasn't worked in the island's media for long, but has already identified a fundamental problem. There are no standards for the written media on the island. Absolutely none. You can print and write anything you like. The governor has asked two newspapers to sign up on a voluntary basis to the UK codes, uh, both for broadcasting uh, standards and for the print media. Uh, but unfortunately, he forgot to put in any teeth. So you can sign up for anything you like, but there is no penalty. If, if, that, if that's what you want to do. But now the government is trying to fix that. Well, we've taken so long trying to organise our media, we might as well take a bit longer. However, the proposed media commission that could fine outlets up to 16,000 US dollars, effectively putting them out of business, has some media workers claiming that the government is encroaching on their freedom of expression. Is your ordinance human rights compliant? That simple. There's even a human rights lawyer weighing in on this. They had to ship her in from South Africa because there's no airport on the island. She met with local councillors to scrutinise the proposed legislation to make sure the government wasn't going too far. Really, when you put onerous punishments for something that just maybe needs a wrap over the knuckles or some sort of sanction that you don't do it again, you need to mediate it. You don't need to send the guy to prison or deprive him of his livelihood. It's a pretty small place to have two radio stations, two newspapers, a media commission and a human rights lawyer. But both sides are trying to keep things civil. 
at least for the sake of appearances. <laughs> the, the big spoon. Yeah, that was given to me by Governor Andrew Gurr at uh, the Queen's birthday party two weeks ago. Well, being independent, he's able to say more or less what he wants to say. So it was an, I awarded him the stirrer of the year, because if he sees something worth stirring, he does so. I don't think they're all that keen on the free press. They have to say that they are keen on the free press, but uh, deep down, I don't think they like it too much. We are sometimes a bit hard on them, maybe, but it's needed to get a balance with the powers that the government got here. Well, we'll play ourselves out, and I'll see you tomorrow morning with a bit of eagles. They're not really talking about a revolution on St. Helena, but between the muckraking media baron, the offshore legal advisor and the authorities, this tiny island with an historic Napoleonic complex is like a lot of much bigger places. It's trying to find the balance between freedom of the press and the rights and responsibilities of the powers that be. And finally, a little bit earlier, we told you about Newsweek coming together with the Daily Beast website, a corporate survival strategy for the troubled magazine. Our web video of the week is a tongue-in-cheek look at how Newsweek's rival U.S. weekly, Time magazine, might want to change its approach to news coverage. This video is from TheOnion.com, an American satire site that lampoons the media as well as anybody does. What they're taking aim at is what they see as the dumbing down of an American journalistic institution and the hard news coverage that has given way to splashy graphics and trend pieces. We'll see you next time at The Listening Post. Publishers of Time magazine announced that they'll soon be releasing a new version of their magazine for adults. Readers who grew up loving the magazine's bright, glossy photos, news by the numbers, and simple-to-understand stories will now be able to graduate to Time Advanced. Instead of Time's breezy, kid-friendly summaries, Advanced boasts a more mature tone aimed at an audience ready for grown-up news. While kids love Time for its fun articles about litter and new kinds of dinosaurs, managing editor Kerry Larson explained that Time Advanced will look to distinguish itself with carefully researched, long-form journalism in a smaller, adult-sized font. Time is and always will be a magazine for children. Time Advanced, however, is for more sophisticated readers who prefer book reviews that don't just tell you whether to read, skim, or toss that newest book on climate change. Educators have long praised Time for making current events accessible to kids with short attention spans and growing vocabularies. Time is my favorite. They always talk about Lady Gaga and the changing face of depression in America. But the company's change in focus to adult news has led to some shakeups at the venerable children's publication. Richard Sherman, who has written columns as the beloved children's character Joe Klein, is leaving the magazine to join the cast of the PBS show Dragonfly TV.